I just want to take a moment and have you contemplate the following, that we are taking, we have our events on, on the la unceded lands of the Blackfoot people and the Métis Nation of Alberta, region number three, and as such, we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. And we commit to do our utmost to assist with the efforts to mend and heal past and present injustices. So again, more, more stuff before we begin, thank yous. So thank you to the LSCO who have provided this room free of charge and you're encouraged to uh, patronize the lunch counter. And thank you to the University of Lethbridge for ongoing support, the Lethbridge Herald and Bridge City News for their coverage and thank you to Shaw TV for recording and airing the sessions. Um, and on that note, because we're recording the sessions, please be sure to mute your cell phones. Um, and SACPAW is a membership-driven organization, um, so you are welcome to join SACPAW for a total of $30 a year. There's you can sign up at the back table where there's also a suggestion box where if you have comments about this session or ideas for others, you're welcome to submit them. So those of us who come regularly know the format, but let's just go over it again. Um, there'll be a 25 to 30 minute presentation followed by a 30 minute Q&A and we finish at 1 <laughs> p.m. on the dot. So now today's speaker will be Mandy Sandback. Um, talking on growing relationships and growing food and food resiliency in particular. And Mandy is one of these people, I know, I know her because we kind of swing in an overlapping circle. Um, I mostly know her through the Lethbridge Sustainable Living Association and most specifically um, I went to a workshop that she had uh, which kind of calmed me down in the whole aspect of being an aspire, aspiring zero waster. So she's very much about flying close to the earth. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mandy. That was way better than a bio, thank you. <laughs> So normally how this works for me when I'm sharing in community is I'm walking around and I have an armful of goodies that I'm passing around and showing you examples of and we're really like intimately interacting so this is a little different for me today so this, this feels uh, in alignment with that. Um, welcome, thanks for, for having me. This is. Um, I think when Lori Schultz and I were having a conversation way back in, in May, she, we were in some flow of something really great and she said, yes, will you come share that? So as we were leading into this, this week of the presentation happening, um, I had to really check in and remember what it was I agreed to talk about because I talk about all kinds of things in, in my everyday life. Um, and so putting together the PowerPoint today really was trying to harness a heartfelt experience of relationship um, and relationship as it relates to our community food systems, our local food systems. All right, so the first thing that feels meaningful for me in relationship to acknowledge is also a land acknowledgement. Closer? <laughs> Uh, land acknowledgement. Uh, my cutting my teeth in the realm of growing food and understanding local ecosystems and understanding relationships with the land have come from this Blackfoot territory. A lot of my teachers have, have um, been of Blackfoot heritage and I would be remiss by not acknowledging um, that the generosity of spirit the willingness to keep language going, the willingness to teach about specific <coughs> seeds and plants for this area um, have touched me deeply. And so I just want to acknowledge um, that to the teachers who have taught me, um, some of which is infusing what we're going to talk about today. Um, we got some action here, Leona. Uh, so my name is Mandy. I wear a lot of different hats in the community, the main one being the president of the Lethbridge Sustainable Living Association. I've sort of worn that hat for the last, I don't even know, six or seven years as my guest. Um, I also have a business called Soulfully Soil and I dabble in uh, support for community gardens, communal gardens. I do a lot of teaching, uh, a lot of canning, jamming, pickling, food preservation, um, fermenting, like Leona uh, alluded to when she introduced me. Part of the Lethbridge Sustainable Living Association, the role that I've taken on is really making knowledge of 
how we can a grow our own food lo locally, um, but also how to preserve it and use it and distribute it to the people who might need that. Um, so our zero waste or uh, our zero waste programs through the Lethbridge Sustainable Living Association. Sometimes we'll do we'll be doing classes and teaching people how to reduce, assess, and reduce the waste that they're using in their own lives. Um, you might find me out at a juicing event, uh, kind of all over the place within the community. I'm a permaculture designer. Um, I've been a colon hydrotherapist, a foot reflexologist, uh, all kinds of things. So this, this um, kind of like diverse group of information that I've taken on has led me to why I'm talking to you here today. Any luck? Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in a homesteading family. I grew up in northern BC. So my grandma and my grandpa and all the uncles and the aunties, they grew, each person grew different animals. Each person had a niche, uh, whether it was fishing or hunting or canning or jamming or using all the kids as the labor in the garden. That was my main memory uh, that was planted by my parents and my grandparents. Um, picking beans, shelling peas until my, my fingers bled. Those were this, those those were the memories that stuck with me and then as I became to uh, become an adult I started to ask questions about our food systems where is the food coming from who's growing the food what are the practices being used what is it that I'm putting in my body what do I want for my children and all of those questions started leading me down a path of leading a more sustainable more close to the earth type of life um, cutting out a lot of that process stuff as I educated myself um, yeah, so that's that's a little tiny, tiny little drop of who I am. I'm a mother of three kids, 18, 19, and 20 years old. Two kids that grew up and graduated through a pandemic, which is a very different world today than it seems to have been a couple of years ago. Um, and I think when Lori and I were originally talking about what I would have to offer, I think that's part of where that, that emerged from, is this notion of relationships in a changing world. And there's so much that is changing. There is so much that is different. Um, it can often be really disconcerting and how do we move forward that sense of powerlessness we feel like how are we going to even begin to make a difference for our kiddos and our grandkids um, and so when I was asked to speak, the, the notion of relationship and relating and resiliency was really important for me. It stood out. One of the things that's been highlighted during this sort of COVID era for me has been this, this level of polarization in beliefs and then how we come together and relate in that. And it's destroyed a lot of relationships. And so when we look at nature and we look at ecosystems, what we understand is this beautiful, cohesive, um, interconnected, interreliant upon way of being. And I think as human yeah. civilizations, <laughs> Wonderful. We can we can learn a thing or two from her. Her being the earth. Um, so part of my permaculture training has me asking questions, has me looking to nature to really give me the cues and ideas and, and nudges in a direction or not of what is aligned, what is abundant, what does thriving societies and food societies look like, what is local food. If we take it out of the realm of retail space, what does that actually mean? Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about relating and relationship. And I hope that you can soften your hearts and your minds a little bit to take this into whatever elements of your life feels right and true and authentic for you. So we're gonna talk about food, but we can't talk about food system relationships without talking about human relating because we are intricately entwined in that system. One of the most incredible uh, examples of relationship in foods that, we, that, that I've learned about um, is the Three Sisters Companion Planting Method. Indigenous peoples all over the world have had a version of this for eons. It is something that has been tried and true for generations and generations. And as a Western civilization, I, don't, I think we're just on the cusp of coming back to this knowledge and understanding that plants relate. They form communities. They 
form communities of symbiosis and connection and interrelation, and the only way they thrive and stay healthy and alive is if they have those relationships. The Three Sisters Companion is a beautiful, simple example of this. So this is an unexpected relationship. I suspect when you came t today, some of you were thinking about human relating, not necessarily how are the plants interrelating. But with the corn, beans, and squash, what they teach us is that we can each have a gift, a unique gift that we emanate. And as we come together in community, we're able to share those gifts for the betterment of the whole. We are better whole together than we are individually. So the way this patterning works is you grow your corn up the center, a nice tall stalk. Corn is a heavy feeder. It requires lots of nitrogen. Um, and so that's where the beans come in. The beans need a pole to wrap around. The beans are nitrogen fixers for the microbes in the soil. So what we do is we plant the corn with the beans, and the beans wind their way up the corn stalk as it grows, fixing nitrogen in the soil for that plant to feed on. We need to cover the soil, so that's where the squash comes in. The squash grows and proliferates out into the garden space, taking up all the space and all the land, covering the soil, keeping the moisture at the soil level. And so it's working to protect the microbes and what the health of those plants require. And so it's this unlikely relationship in the soil. So as a permaculture designer, one of the things I'm looking for are examples of this. And then I take it into my human realm and I look at our existing growing systems. What are we doing? What's missing? Are we fostering these relationships more and more or are we cutting them off by removing elements, which doesn't usually fare very well. So I'm just using this as a tiny example of relating. So permaculture is a weird word. Maybe before today you've never actually heard of the term. Maybe you have and you're not entirely sure. Permaculture uh, was sort of born out of this notion of permanent agriculture or permanent culture. It's a way of recognizing and engaging with the world and its interconnections within that world and then creating more and more of that. Um, so it talks about and expands upon not just connection to yourself but connection with yourself and your family, your family and the community that you live in, your community that you live in, and the natural world and the ecosystems around you, whether that be the microbes or the soil, the plants, the insects, the birds, the mammals, um, the sun, the moon, deserts, forests. I don't, I don't, um, it, it's just not specific to one thing. It's how we relate and interrelate with all of um, what is happening around us. It sets up um, this mindset of a whole ecosystem paradigm. So a lot of what we've seen is reductionist science, uh, science happening over the last few hundred years where we remove components from an ecosystem and then see how they behave on their own when they were never naturally intended to be on their own and singular and isolated. So what permaculture does is brings those elements back together and watches the patterning of how they relate with one another. So it's not just about growing food, it's about how we grow our human systems, how we choose to relate in community, how we create um, relationships between seniors and young people, um, how we create uh, relationships between new Canadians and Canadians who have been here for longer. This is a seven generations mindset thinking. So we're not making decisions about our food growing and our local food security without considering the impact long term. So we're thinking about our grandbabies, grandbabies, grandbabies. Every time we make make a decision, and that is how nature works. It isn't something off the cuff, it isn't something not considered. Um, and so that's kind of what permaculture focuses on. The main, permaculture has a main uh, orientation of ethics and principles, and the principles are always, always growing. They're, they're started with 12, and there's probably 20 of them now. Um, as we get to know ourselves and we really dive into this, we get to know more. But the foundation of permaculture is that it's putting these three things at the forefront. These are our intentions. What we want to do in our relating with our human um, friends and our other than human friends and our growing systems is we really want to take into consideration earth care. Is this decision that I'm making, is what I'm planting, is how I'm planting it, is it taking into consideration the best needs and desires and, and what this particular piece of earth 
wants. Am I considering the people in that? Am I considering all the people, our marginalized populations, our seniors, our kids, our young people, our old people, all of that? Are we, cons are we considering those people equally? And then that brings us to equity. In whatever it is we're deciding to do about growing um, food systems, in this case, is it, equ is it equitable? Are we sharing the benefits of whatever it is that we're doing equally? And if we're not, how do we distribute that to create the equality uh, or the equity within that? So these are the foundational ethics um, for permaculture. So one of the other things that uh, we decided on a title was talking about resiliency. I think too often the term sustainable gets chucked around now. It's very m mainstream. You hear it all the time. I don't want to live in a world that I just become sustainable. I just break even. I just don't cause that much harm. I think we can do better than that. I want a thriving, abundant, resilient, regenerative uh, community. I want a thriving, abundant, resilient, regenerative food systems that when we have a massive storm that comes through, there's components that have been diversified that still allow certain things to have grown. Uh, and that is resiliency. So I think we can aim for better than sustainability. Resiliency for me is a sense of adaptability. This spider web says it all. Everybody knows that a spider builds a web a very intelligent way in order to not, so if something happens to that web and a tiny little corner gets plucked out, it's not devastating for the web. It can still stand within its strength. To me, the metaphor of this is in community. The more of these relationships, the more of these connections and interconnections we can create, create, uh, the more resilient we are, the more adaptable we are, the more uh, ability we have to recover when things happen. Uh, another way to put this is anti-fragile. So one of the things that's been really glaringly obvious to me over through the last couple of years of COVID is we have a super fragile food system. We depend on distribution and manufacturing overseas and in different places. So when the trucking or the, the train shut down or uh, whatever, we can't get the elements we need to create certain things goes down, we're all left going, oh no, what do we do now? So if, uh, an anti-fragile system or a resilient system would have things and systems in place to really cut that out, to really localize, hyper-localize, uh, bring things back into the region as much as possible. Um, so we ask ourselves questions like, how have you designed your home, your life, your finances, your own food systems? One of the things I typically say before I start talking, there was a little bit of a a blip at the beginning here is don't take my word for anything that's coming out of my mouth. Um, but what I do invite you all to is a sense of curiosity, a sense of play, a sense of, well, that's interesting. She talked about fragility, or that's interesting. She talked about resiliency. Uh, do I know where my carrots come from? I, that childlike mind that allows us to ask questions and kind of push into the edge a little bit of the story we were told, right? My mom used to say, don't sit too close to the TV because you're going to go blind. And then at some point I realized, well, that's not actually how that works. Um, you know, asking the question and, and, and educating yourself about what's happening. This mindset allows us to do that. The more we are willing to ask questions and challenge an existing reality, the more resilient we become because we don't just accept things the way they are. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to accept the world that we have in this moment. This doesn't feel like the ultimate of what is possible for my grandbabies. So I want to be able to, um, to connect and relate and create a life that is resilient, personally, but also in my communities that I live in. Um, resiliency is directly proportionate to the uh, quality of your relationships. So everybody's got a family here and everybody knows that families are fun to play in and sometimes we don't all get along. Um, as we don't um, have healthy, nurtured, heard, deeply connected relationships, however those look in your life, um, they, they don't produce the greatest results. So the more open and communicative and accepting and, and kind and all of those things we can be, the more resiliency we'll ha that we will have. Uh, symbiosis is something we see in nature all the time. There's these beautiful s examples and metaphors of symbiotic relationships. The soil is a really good example. The microbes, the fungi, the viruses, the bacteria, the archaea, the protozoa, all those 
wonderful little creatures, and I think you guys have been talked to about soil quite a bit the last little while, um, that are growing in there. They are their own ecology. They support one another and how they live and how they go about. So what we want to do in our local food systems is create more of this stability by being comfortable in instability. So here's a really great example of something that, that um, I've come to know differently for myself. We all talk about self-sufficiency. So in the world of um, permaculture, in the world of sustainable living, uh, there's lots of conversation about, I'm going to be self-sufficient. I'm going to buy a, a cabin off-grid, and I'm going to take care of all my needs, and I'm going to do it all by myself. Uh, that's been tried, and that doesn't work. Uh, we all can't be the shoemakers. I have absolutely less than zero interest in uh, metalwork. Whereas my husband, that's his, that's his niche. He can do that. And so as we learn to understand what each of our gifts are and what really lights us up and then stepping into community from there, we can learn a lot from that. So we cannot be self-sufficient. You can't do all the things. You can sure try, but you're going to be an angry human at the end of it, a burnt out, overwhelmed, exhausted, crying in a puddle. I, I've tried it. It, doesn't, it has not worked for me. So the mind shift here is we can be sufficient and, and and take um, care of and control of where our food comes from and how it's grown and how we distribute that. And then let's have those conversations. Let's have those curiosities out loud with our community. What do you have to bring to the table? What do you have to bring to the table? And then we can start having conversations about community sufficiency. So we are, again, we are stronger as a community in this room. If I were to pass out pieces of paper to each one of you and ask you to give me the top three things that make you most excited that you could offer to a community, we would have an incredible list. It would blow your mind. I've done this exercise in groups before. And you would realize that all of our needs are accounted for right in this room. So if that's true and we take it out into our larger community, where are the places we can start interacting and the skills we can start sharing with one another to increase our sufficiency, our localized economies? So I'm talking about not just relationship with yourself and your body and your own health and vitality, what you're putting into your body, but I'm also talking about relationships in terms of um, how we take it outside of here. So what does local even mean? Well, it could be, you know, we've, we hear 100 kilometers from where you live. Um, Yes, that could be one choice, um, but I promise you, here within 20 kilometers, you can get most everything that you require in order to live. Um, so start looking at relationships internally as this is my first relationship, and then look outside into your immediate families and your immediate communities, and then take it out a step and take it out a step. Maybe this could be an exercise for you to sit down and actually write down all of those points of connection. There is a lot of experience in this room. There is a lot of history of relationships, and you guys know a lot of human beings in this community and others. So how can we reach out and expand that web? And then we want to start asking questions about how am I relating to my farmers? Do you know your farmers' names? Do you know where your food comes from, whether it's your animal products or your vegetables, your honey, your milk? Um, do you, even just knowing the name of the company, well, who owns that company and where are they based out of? Starting to educate ourselves about some of these questions is not intended as a shaming, <laughs> it's not a shaming exercise. It's to inform you so you can start to know what other questions to ask, to elicit something um, and, and the places where you can actually uh, interfere and make change in your life. So you want to know who in the community is doing these things. <clears throat> I'm just deciding which slide is going to be best for this. All right, so some existing local waste reduction and distribution folks that are doing some great things in town. The Lethbridge Fruit Rescue Program. Uh, the City of Lethbridge recently uh, created a Love Food Hate Waste program as well, so you'll see them at a variety of events. Um, some of the, one of the biggest ways we can look at food security in our local area is looking at our waste. Where are we just, things are rotting? Where are things not being distributed? These are some of the places to 
look at that. Uh, local uh, restaurants and cafes that I'm aware of are places like Tim Hortons and Cobbs. They have extra, and then they're distributing it into different spaces as well. The Interface Food Bank Food Recovery Program is an amazing program. They're taking excess of what has been distributed, and then they bring volunteers into the kitchen space, and you cook and transform that into something else that can be prepared and preserved, and then they distribute it out to their community. Let's talk about seconds and uglies. That's what this picture is actually designed to show you. I'm not sure if you're aware or not, but there's this uh, idea in industry of food production in that we have these ugly looking vegetables. Those are not the ones that are making it into your Safeway and your Save On in those places because they're not pretty enough. But I guarantee most every farmer that we have locally has this pile of funny looking carrots or funny looking onions or potatoes. When we start to identify that waste stream, rather than them having to, to compost or let that rot, we can start distributing some of those things and, and intentionally purchasing them. We get them at a better rate, we get them at a larger quantity, um, and we're able to, um, yeah, just get that food distributed. So here's some practical ways to increase your own personalized food resiliency. Some of these I've talked about already. Um, learning how to grow your own food. So the Seed to Supper program at the Interfaith Food Bank that runs every February and March. Uh, maybe you're not there yet eh, or anymore. You don't want to grow a garden. You don't want to be responsible for that. But you could support some of our local community and communal gardens that exist. We have a number of them in town here. Um, composting. So taking control of your own waste stream. Start asking if you're not cooking for yourself and maybe you live, say, in a senior center having a conversation with the chef of where is the waste going and then maybe making some connections and relationship with other people who are doing the composting would work um, again educating yourself on what it is you are purchasing what is local where does this come from um, and sometimes opting out of things I have friends trying on not eating avocados and bananas because they don't come from here I'm not quite there yet but I am mindful about it when I buy it um, but maybe that's a choice that would fit for your lifestyle Meal planning, we reduce, we don't have as much waste when we meal plan. Uh, making community meals, getting together for annual or weekly potlucks or once a month potlucks, getting together to cook large volumes of food and then identifying families and friends who might need that food, distributing it that way. Learning knowledge, gaining knowledge, um, things like fermenting and canning and jamming and pickling, uh, dehydrating, all of those things are really good skills if we're looking at local food and being able to utilize it and keep it for longer term. Again, we talked about uh, identifying local waste streams. We have thousands of public fruit trees and private fruit, fruit trees and shrubs and um, plants like raspberries in Lethbridge alone. And so we have programs set up that are intended to pick that fruit to make it uh, not go to waste, not end up in a landfill, and then make it into another product where we can um, share it with, with our community. So start asking questions, start getting to know um, um, some of where your food is coming from is a really great way. Encouraging your city officials and whoever is making these decisions to start making decisions like, let's put more fruit orchard space. The city of Lethbridge has done this a couple of times already in their newer park areas. I want to see um, local food forest systems that are in those parks so that long term my kids can go and pick from those trees. We have an abundant resource of food that we're just not using effectively. We have food cooperatives you can buy in bulk. Not all of us are at the stage. I went from a family of five to mostly it's just my partner and I. I can't cook the same way I used to, so we're using less volume. So now we've gotten together with a few other families and we buy together in order to keep our costs down and be able to buy local. So the Lethbridge Sustainable Living Association, the Fruit Rescue Program, uh, Aquaponics World, Environment Lethbridge, Helen Schuler, Ecole Verandry, the, the College Aquaponics Center for Excellence, Secure Your Food, Cottonwood Co-op, all of these people here are just one page of examples of people who are doing amazing things to A, create local food systems, maintain the ones that we have, get those things distributed, um, effectively reduce the waste of the food that is being grown here um, and lots and lots of programming uh, lots and lots of programming um, through those organizations as well so I'm on a time frame and I probably am not I'm not making eye contact with Leona right now <laughs> um, 
the, the latter half of my um, talk here is about the Lethbridge Sustainable Living specifically. I think we're going to move into a question and answer, um, but perhaps I can just talk for two minutes about the fruit rescue because that's a, that's a very major part of what we do as an organization. And I'll summarize all of that um, a little better. So the Lethbridge Sustainable Living Association's focus is hands-on, grassroots, connecting people to the spaces, the places, the people, the organizations that are teaching skills, that are supportive of your sustainable journey, if we can call it that. All of us are in different points in our life and different points in that sustainable journey. Um, so we have a number of initiatives from the Zero Waste Program to the Aquaponics Program, which uh, we're connected to the Aquaponics system that's just out here in the kitchen. If you haven't seen it, please stop and have a look at it. Um, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, we have the um, Permaculture Lethbridge Group, which was integral in creating the Ecola Verandries Edible Forest Learning Garden. If you haven't been to the school, it's worth seeing. But this is our major program, the Lethbridge Fruit Rescue Program. So what we do is we connect volunteers with landowners who have fruit trees and shrubs that are going to waste. A lot of our seniors in town can't pick the apples anymore. A lot of people are just too busy and they're running multiple jobs. And it is an absolute resource. So what we've done is we have fundraised over the last several years and we have a commercial juice press. So we can come directly on site, we pick, the volunteers pick the apples, we juice the apples or the, or the volunteers take apples home if that's what you want. Um, and then we convert it into juice and there's been thousands of liters of juice donated to the Interfaith Food Bank and the Soup Kitchen in Lethbridge and our volunteers as well. Um, this is a major program that we run throughout the summer. I mean, COVID was a little tricky. We couldn't do a lot the last couple of years, but it is a resource in our community. Um, and it's one of the main ways you'll see us out in public. So this is Jen with our, our juice that, our boiler that brings the juice up uh, to pasteurize it, and then we can them. We sell them as a uh, fundraiser in the wintertime, um, fresh pressed juice. And that is all food that was rotting on the ground and feeding the deer. And so we have, we're always looking for volunteers to help come pick. If you don't have access to apples in your world and you want some because you want to make some pies and it's been a while since you've done that, connect with our coordinator and they will pick a bag and they will drop it. We are not a picking service, I'm supposed to tell you that. We are not a picking service. But we, we connect volunteers with the landowners and make that happen. Um, that's Pat, that's probably who you'll deal with. But we have sour cherries, pears, all kinds of apples, um, tons of pears, actually there's some city pears as well available, um, lots of berries as well. So that's a little tiny snapshot of who we are as an organization. If you have any other questions, um, I don't know how it works, Leona will tell you. <laughs> You're on the hot seat, thanks. Okay, it's question and answer time. And so questions line up along the wall here. Um, so when you get up here, state your name, keep your question brief, keep your preamble brief. And um, if you need to submit written questions, you can do that to me and I will ask the question on your behalf. Um, and yeah, let's go. First question coming up. Give me a long walk for a little question. Yeah. Tell us about more about the edible Who are fruit. You? Oh, Alan Friesen's my name. Hi. Tell us more about the edible fruit learning garden thing. I didn't quite understand that. What was that? So amazing. Thank you for asking. I have slides about that. Oh, let's see them. Um, so. I don't even know. Five or six years ago, I was uh, connected through relationship with a friend of mine that was working with the Ecola Verandri School, and they were doing some amazing things. They've got growing walls and worm bins and solar panels and all kinds of fun things. And their coordinator was, they had a, a garden at the school, and um, so the coordinator, Monique, and I, um, I was able to do a permaculture design for it. We secured a grant, and we were able to 
add to their existing annual food garden beds that they had, and then we were able to add what's called a food forest. So it's a layered uh, growing approach that mimics what we would see in a natural forest system. So you have an overstory, a great big apple tree, or a great big pear tree, or an oak tree. Um, and then we have understories like lilacs and elderberry and sea buckthorn, and then our herbaceous layer of all the edible and medicinal plants that come from there all the way down to ground cover of things we've placed. So there's this beautiful design done at the school. The forest is now in its fifth or sixth year. Um, so you're starting to see succession where some plants are dying back and the other ones are just thriving. So there's an immense amount of food planted in a very small space. The other thing that you'll see at the Edible Forest Learning Garden is the um, the pathways, the swale pathways. So we live in Alberta, we get 260 millimeters of rain a year, which is not a lot. So part of our design for the forest for its regenerative ability in the future was making sure we had water harvesting on site. And so the mulch pathways that you walk in and through are actually water collectors. So when, the, when it does rain, it is able to absorb and soak up and then slowly release that water over time, which is part of the reason why it's done so well. Go look at the sea buckthorn trees and it'll blow your mind how big they are uh, compared to when we put them in. So it's, where, a, it's where, a learning. Where at the French school? At 20th Street and 6th Ave South at the French school. Yeah. Yeah, 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 French school. Yeah, totally. And they're really open to community wandering through and snacking as you go and having a look. And um, there's plans for a little bit of expansion in that too. But it demonstrates a very small space uh, and how much food you can actually grow in a very small space with a little bit of effort using those techniques of food forestry. So Beautiful. yeah. I, I'll try and pull some slides up here. Hello, I'm Mary Shillington. And if I was trying to get a grandchild interested in permaculture, uh, where would they have to go to learn some training and to learn some information and be able to work in that field? Okay. You're after my heart today with these <laughs> questions. Uh, anywhere. Um, so many options now compared to what there used to be. Uh, I took a permaculture course. My first one was with Verge Permaculture that's out of Calgary. Um, very well known, very high end class. Um, with, with, with the pandemic times, we haven't been able to do it in person the way that we used to. So my question to you and your grandchildren would be, how do you like to learn? Do you like to learn over the series of a f you know several months o online? Does that work for you? Or do you want to be in an immersive experience where you go somewhere and you camp and you do a two-week hands-on eat breathe sleep example of permaculture um, and so when that answer is sort of flushed out then you make a choice from there so there's multiple people teaching PDCs here we call them PDCs here in Canada um, there's tons and tons of information online you can um, I, I could rattle off some websites right now that you're probably not going to memorize in a moment. I'm happy to write them down for you. Um, but if you just Google permaculture, people like Jeff Lawton and Toby Hemingway and uh, Bill Mollison, they will all come up. Uh, Star, uh, Starhawk teaches out of BC, and um, Kim Chi teaches somewhat locally in the Kootenays here, and then Verge is in Calgary. If they're little kiddos, there's lots online that they can start to learn from, for sure. Um, but elicit how you want to learn. So I went to a, a permaculture design course with a bunch of engineers, which was like really heady and calculations of math and water, and, and I was like, Cool. I thought this was going to be like we were going to hold hands and sing songs and, and walk barefoot in the soil. Um, and so that was not a, a fit for me. So I found that example later on. So that's a really important part of it, I think, to connect with w how you will learn and how it will land properly. So I can give you more resources actually written down afterwards if you like. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm really interested in the Le Colbiandre um, uh, forest. Mm -hmm. That sounds fabulous. Um, so, okay, yes, Bev Mundelatherstone, <laughs> uh, Ryan would like you to read out the uh, actual websites of the sites that you mentioned. Okay. And my question is, uh, how do you get in touch with the food harvesting, either to be a harvester or to get some of the produce? Okay. You said you're going to record my slides, right? You'll have my slides. So I'll go back. Okay. 
All right, so here's just some basic email contact, uh, contact information. Um, our website's up there as well. So the Lethbridge Fruit Rescue Program, sending them an email to the Gmail account is the easiest way to get a hold of them there if you're interested in the food production piece of it. And then if you are just looking for general information, the sustainablelivingassociation.org is our website. What was your first question, Bev? That was the first one. The second question was about how do we get the fruit and how do we help harvest it? Sending an email to the Fruit Rescue Program uh, directly. What will happen is Pat will put you on the email list and at the beginning of every season she reaches out to say this is what the season's looking like and then she sends updates. Okay, we have this ready, we have that ready. Um, so just get on that volunteer uh, list by emailing the Fruit Rescue Program. And how do you get the product? You, you, you just, when you pick it, you get it. Um, so in season, you can show up to the pickings and you bring your boxes or your bags or whatever and you pick them right there on site. If you can't come out and pick, then you just talk to Pat and she will always pick a box for somebody. The Lethbridge Fruit Rescue, whatever I just had up there, <laughs> Lethbridge Fruit Rescue Program at gmail.com, I think. Yeah, did I, did I capture that? Okay. Hi, my name is Lori Schultz, and Mandy, thank you very much for a really wonderful presentation. So, so much information. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more, um, and I'm sure our audience would, about the Lethbridge Sustainable Living Association. So, could you just uh, give a little bit more history to the association, whether there's an opportunity for people to join, when that might be, um, and how people might uh, become involved. Yeah, great, Thanks. thank you. Um, all right, so the history is the Lossbridge Sustainable Living Association's been a society, I think, you guys, in 2012. Jill's in here, he's one of the founding members of the LSLA. Uh, the original group started with a common intention of wanting to build an eco-village and all getting together and, and delving into all the realm of sustainable living, including a common space to live. Um, that went on for a few years and then about five, six years ago when I got involved, they were coming to a place place where there just wasn't any traction so we had a rebirth of the organization that's where I stepped in I accidentally went to a meeting and then mm -hmm. they needed a president um, and so since then we've kind of morphed and in, in changed into this real um, hub of a space to be able to connect people with all aspects of sustainable living so I always talk about my friend Dill who's really clear she doesn't want to grow food she's not interested in that so she started the community clothing swap that's one of our, our branches or our arms of our organization. So about it, four times a year, we collect clothing and then we just find a space and then we distribute it. You come, there's no cost. We just want to keep that in motion as opposed to going to a landfill. Another part of our organization is zero waste Lethbridge. So for example, prior to COVID when we could get together, um, we had Days for Girls come in and then teach a handful of us how to make reusable menstrual pads um, with cloth. We've done um, gas Gatherings, monthly gatherings where we are uh, making reusable paper towels or reusable tissues out of old sheets and pillowcases and and so we're that particular um, part of the organization focuses on teaching people ways they can reduce their waste personally uh, who else am I missing permaculture Lethbridge has everything to do with all the growing that is their jam um, which is mostly just me teaching so we do composting workshops we do workshops on how to build garden guilds like these this notion of food forestry um, we'll do uh, teaching in that way the seed to supper program is one of it, it's not a permaculture Lethbridge initiative it's an interfaith food bank um, but there's always uh, collaboration and cross-contamination in those areas who am I missing? The Urban Hens, I think you guys were spoken to perhaps a few weeks ago or a month ago or something um, from Kelty and Jill about our Urban Hens YQL movement. So this is a movement for the city of Lethbridge to adjust bylaws or add an amendment or whatever to allow backyard chickens. They're, they're, um, the research talks about the chickens as being one of those things we can do to increase our food resiliency here at home. And so that initiative is really working towards getting city, the city to agree to that. Who am I missing, Lori? 
Oh yeah, aquaponics, uh, Lethbridge, we don't actually have a name. We'll just call it the aquaponics arm. Um, Gabrielle and Michael came to us from Aquaponics World. They had some ideas about outreach and how to build these. Aquaponics is growing food and fish together. So again, right out this door, there's a beautiful example of it. If you haven't seen it, you have to stop by. Um, and so the notion is that we can now grow indoors. So we're diversifying how we're growing and how we can grow local. There is no more local than having an aquaponics station in your house that grows year round. Um, and so aquaponics um, arm or branch of our organization focuses on that. So uh, Gabrielle and Michael have installed numerous of these systems in schools, senior centers, um, yeah, just lots of different places in the city uh, to teach the kids hands on. Here's what the system looks like. This is how you take care of it. So I think I think I covered all of our branches of the organization itself. So that being said, we are in a transformational moment in our organization. We are having our AGM on November 6th. I am moving out of the community in the next few months, as is my partner, who's also on the board. And so we're having this uh, older blood, if you will, leaving the organization. And so we are putting our feelers out for folks who want to participate and want to kind of fumble their way through the sustainable living thing and stepping in where it feels meaningful. So we are looking for board members and members uh, at large as well. But we're looking for a few people to, to step up and just um, take on the organization. We've left a beautiful uh, foundation financially um, as well as a running machine that's kind of already going on. One of the things that we focus on as an organization, if any of you are involved in nonprofit, burnout's real, especially with volunteer boards, it happens. So we've really focused on you only step in where it's meaningful. Don't be the note taker if that makes you groan every time you do that. So what we're looking for is people to help carry this into the next layer of whatever the future looks like here in Lethbridge. And there's never been a bigger time for it. Um, the other thing about the organization, again, the AGM's on November 6th. It is being held online. If you just want to pop in and see what we're about, that's a really good way to do that. You can send me an email um, via the email addresses I put up here that I'll put back before I leave. Uh, and let me know and I can send you the link. I think it'll be posted publicly on Facebook as well. Uh, and the other thing is the Interfaith Food Bank, um, I'm going to be teaching two fermenting classes this coming Tuesday, October 25th. We're doing sauerkraut. And then two weeks later, we're going to do kombucha. And so we will utilize the Chinook Country Kitchen and, and create in that space. That had nothing to do with us specifically, but I hope that covers it. Hi, Mandy. My name is Henning Mundel. And I have a question. I don't even know if this group still exists, and if it does, how you relate to them. Some years ago, there was a, a young man, but it was a, quite a group. They went around town asking people if they were willing to give their front yards mm -hmm. for uh, vegetable growing, mm -hmm. and I know, and then they were selling them a uh, product in the farmer's market. That's where I came across them, yeah. and, but I hadn't heard you talk anything at all about yeah. uh, converting of uh, gardens. And yeah, yeah. Spin farming, spin farming. I think it's what everybody's lawn should look like. You get a little piece of green and the rest is veggies. Um, yeah, that was Josh. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm blanking on his synergy farms, I think, is what he ultimately landed on. For So he's no longer in our community. Spin farming is a technique that is taught during your permaculture design. It's just one of those ways you can interact and create natural ecosystems to increase the amount of food you can grow. Uh, it's a wonderful technique. To my knowledge, there's not anybody else doing it in town right now, um, which is a bit of a shame because there's lots of yards to utilize. Uh, if you take a drive, even down 16th Avenue south, um, kind of up into where the uh, the gas station is there on the corner of Mayor McGrath. There's a couple of yards that have converted their yards into garden space. So whenever I get a chance, I pull over and I try and find an owner and give them a thumbs up on, on what they're doing. Spin farming is small plot intensive farming. And what they do is they, they negotiate. You come into a lease. They, they take care of your yard for you. And they grow vegetables in a variety of different yards throughout the season. The landowner gets a portion of those for free, typically is the way it works and then that person takes the rest of the produce and sells it on behalf of his business so rather than having an acreage or acres somewhere else they utilize space right here locally in town um, and it's a brilliant a brilliant strategy nobody's doing that, now? Nobody's doing that to my knowledge no no um, 
yeah, no. There's lots of it in Calgary and Red Deer. There just is, hasn't been anybody else. There was one other girl doing it small scale, but she moved out of town as well. Okay. Yeah. So my name is Mark Gettle. Uh, till the mid 90s, Cuba was almost 100% uh, dependent on Russia, on the USSR for its for its food, for its fuel, for its pesticides. Then when the USSR fell apart, they were left without fuel for their tractors and nothing. And since then, they've bas basically been doing exactly what you've been saying. About 15 years ago, a group of scientists, we went and had a tour, and it was just amazing how every plot of empty plot within the city was growing vegetables. They were sold on the side of the, of the street in little kiosks. They were all co-ops. They were producing their own pesticide, biocontrol agents, mm -hmm. biopesticides. And uh, these tours, I think, are still available. I think it would be just fantastic if you could ar arrange a tour. Uh, of that, and there's a person in uh, Vancouver that was uh, putting these tours together. So yeah. I, would, I would suggest that if you get a group together that had enough money to fly to Cuba, yeah. uh, it's a, it was a great learning experience how people went from conventional farming to yeah. sustainable, yeah. Uh, I, all organic, yeah. all biocontrol. It was just it was yeah. really an eye opener. Yeah, yeah, that's great. But, so I guess it's not a question, but <laughs> I, th I thought I had to say it. Anyway, yeah. So Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's actually a really great documentary. Uh, is it Cuba Peak Oil or something? I can't entirely remember. Um, that talks about this system out of necessity. It was all removed, and what are you going to do about it? I hear a lot of talk about Victory Gardens, um, especially since COVID. The, the seed sales went through the roof when COVID started. The desire to grow your own gardens, from my perspective, just locally, was insane in demand. Um, people are starting to question some of this, and, and what are we growing locally? So yeah, that's a really great. One of the things we try to do as an organization in the spring, from about February on through the summer, we'll organize yard tours to show you what people right here are doing. If you can make your way out to the college for the Aquaponics Center of Excellence for a tour to see how they're growing food, they're doing some cutting edge research there as well, um, as well as Ecola Verandry, if you can make your way out there and check that out. We have some private yard owners who are doing this, who have food forests in their yards, and they've allowed us to tour around as well. Milpa Naturals at a Cardston, um, Stephen Julien, they have a small uh, permaculture farm going so they're all demonstrating these these out of when you step out of that traditional agricultural mindset like how else can we we do that and cube has done a brilliant job of that I, I'd like to see us head more in that direction yeah we have two more questions coming up and then those will be the last ones and this is my second thank you for indulging Mandy, <clears throat> is there a person or people that will come to, I have a little farm, and on that farm there's stuff growing that I know is of value to people. There's mushrooms growing, I don't know which ones I can eat. So I'm hoping to have somebody come out and guide me, say, oh, this is good, that's bad, this could be used to treat diabetes or whatever, like, you know, what are the natural things I got growing on my place? Somebody can help me with that? <laughs> this is the problem with moving out of community. <clears throat> Saying no. Yeah. personally for me to be that person. Um, I would reach out to the Sustainable Living Facebook page, the Permaculture Lethbridge Facebook page. Uh, there's two people that I'm thinking of that live in Calgary, but they travel here quite regularly to do specifically um, I'll say more wild walking tours as well. Um, if you just come see me afterwards, I can I don't know, do you have a follow-up to these meetings in terms of links and things? Like if I send you a bunch of links, can you distribute it to your folks? I'm just Is that possible? Right here. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's a really great way to get to know if you're if you're living on land or you're just walking through the parkways. One of the ways to start forming a relationship with the, the ecosystem around you is to look. Uh, you might be surprised at how many plants you actually recognize and what your grandma would have said. Eat that, don't eat that. Mushrooms are a good example. Everybody's scared of them. Um, and you know, in some cases that's intelligent, but um, in terms of your own food system, start looking around and seeing what's growing, seeing what's edible. Rose hips are edible. They grow all kinds of places. If we actually walk through and you, you're able to get onto these, uh, these foraging walks, you can learn a lot about what we have here without growing tomatoes and cucumbers and all those other finicky things. Um, sea paws. I, I hope I'm saying that right. I don't actually even know what the organization stands for. 
wilderness. It's a wilderness. It's a wilderness. Yeah. So actually, tomorrow, um, William Singer's doing a, uh, exactly what you're talking Canadian about. Parks a and wilderness. Canadian parks and wilderness. Yeah. So they have ongoing walks in the parks around here, and he walks through and identifies Blackfoot traditional plants and other plants and, and tells story about it. So if you're interested, those are beautiful places to find yourself as well. Um, I don't know if they have room for tomorrow's walk, but they have a bunch coming up as well. Hi, Mandy, again, Laurie Schultz. Um, earlier in your presentation, you spoke to, um, you know, kind of that disintegration of kind of a regional um, uh, support systems. And I'm uh, certainly, you know, in the last number of years, there has been the, the lean method or the um, just-in-time type of thing with a pandemic, so supply chains and whatnot. So I'm, I, I'm just asking for your opinion. Um, have we, especially following the pandemic, have you seen any traction or um, any, any hope that we're moving towards or away from kind of that just-in-time mentality of uh, being able to, so that we're not a vassal state, that we can take care of ourselves, not only with food, but, you know, with, with other things. Have you, in your, in, you know, in your networks, have you seen or heard any comments where, um, you know, we're looking at just, um, we're looking at, at just getting some traction to come back to taking care of ourselves and, and maybe moving away from that that industrial model. Not well articulated, but I think I, I've given you the gist. Yeah, or I'm totally going to be off limits, and I'm going to hurry, Leo, and I promise. Um, is there any traction that I'm seeing? It's, it's um, context is everything. So the people I hang with, the people I spend time with, that's all, for many, many years, that's been our moving, how can we pull ourselves a bit out and, and fill out those gaps for ourselves? We're asking questions, we're knowing where our, our cows are coming from and our pigs are coming from. So I'm insulated in that environment that the people I, I create life with typically are aware of those things. Now, that being said, what I've witnessed, especially during the pandemic, even with my friends in Nova Scotia, where we're headed out, they've had to button it up a little bit and really start to support one another even further than they were before. So they might have had a food co-op before, but they didn't acknowledge that somebody had a disability and couldn't always drive in. So now they're dropping off. There's more of that neighborly like help and, and reciprocity and, and relating happening. Um, and I see it in little ways here. Every phone call I get for the LSLA has something to do with, we just moved to the community. How can we foster this? This type of living. We just had um, two sets of couples show up at our last potluck from out of nowhere, um, wanting to to really deeply create community around those things, acknowledging where where are the supply chains, what where are the gaps, what can we fill locally, and then how do we distribute that that equity thing, like people care, fair share. Um, earth care, uh, really taking the, the neighborly approach of like, I, I have food in my cupboard, now how can we get all of this distributed elsewhere? So I'm seeing it in smaller ways. I don't think I see it governmentally or policy-wise, but I, I don't know that that's how changes happen either. So as each of us take ownership and autonomy of our own waste, our own resources, what we put in our mouths, who we spend time with, what we listen to, what we watch. As we start becoming more mindful of that, we make different choices. And I think that's the only place it can start from. So that's my opinion. Hold that up. Not quite done yet, but um, so next week's talk is on homelessness, a complex social issue. What is the impact of homelessness on encampment and city residents, and what are the solutions? And the speaker will be Mike Fox, whom you see on the news all the time about various things, the Director of Community Services for the City of Lethbridge. And before we go, do you have a takeaway for the audience? Homework? <laughs> I think I've already said it. However you want to. My takeaway is... No, that's bossy. Uh, 
Uh, really, I'm back to the curiosity. If you can soften your heart and what you think you know, that you know, for just a week, and and really settle into, she said there's food systems here. And maybe travel to some of these places, maybe start asking your friends questions about, do you know where your food comes? Not as a point of judgment, but as a curiosity. And start comparing notes. Take an audit of your own, per in, in permaculture we call this zone zero. Out there is zone one. My garden that I use the most is zone one. It's not zone five, because I'm not walking 500 meters that way. So this is zone zero. Take an audit of what you do and how you move through your world. And is there a place, one tiny little place, that you can reduce your waste a little bit? Is there a place where you can buy one item locally because that supports your local system? Even if it's just conversing with your neighbors and bringing awareness to this and, and talking about the importance of relationships in this uh, food security issue. Um, that's a good start. So there's no, I'm not asking you to grab a picket sign and grow a garden, because that's not what most of us are going to do. You're doing it or you're not. Um, but to just soften your heart a little bit and allow some of this to penetrate. Where are the great things being done? She said Environment Lethbridge. She said <coughs> Helen Schuler Nature Center is offering classes. Look around a little and just, just take it in. It's actually really heartwarming. And in a depressing world, like, that feels good. <laughs> so that's it. That's your homework. Thank you, Mandy.